Uh, welcome, welcome <laughs> to you all. It's so great to see so many of you here uh, at the outset. And uh, welcome to faces we know, names we know. Welcome to those we, we don't. Uh, this is the Prehistory Guys uh, Q&A show. Uh, I'm Michael Bott, in case you didn't know, and... Yes, I'm Rupert Soskin, in case you didn't know. Um, uh, I'm down in the south of France. Michael isn't. Uh, which is the excuse for Rupert being a little bit fuzzy, if he is. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. Do you know what? I'll tell you, uh, you might as well know my personal pain. But, um, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I, I live in the middle of nowhere, uh, really, in uh, not far from the Pyrenees. And uh, they've been talking about putting fibre optic into uh, our network for six months now. They made the first appointment to come and install it in my house last October. And uh, they have now made the appointment 12 times and failed to do it 12 times. Uh, so that's why I'm still partially fuzzy. Uh, but, but don't worry too much. My brain is sharp. All right. Uh, too much information, uh, almost. Um, so, as I say, uh, great to see you. And it's great for a really particular reason as well, because we've got a, such a wide-ranging bunch of questions to answer tonight. Mm. And they're great. I've said this before. I'll say it again. We might may not know the answers. I mean, you, some of you may have done more research than we have or even know more than we do. But I tell you what, it stretches our brains, uh, the opportunity to look at things that we would probably may not otherwise have, have looked at is mm. fantastic. Uh, and to, you know, and thank you for that, for, you know, those mm. that have uh, asked us the questions. And I'll even tell you if what, you don't have that. Go on, Rupert, sorry. I was just going to say there's another aspect to that as well, and that's that sometimes you ask us questions that – oh, hang on, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, sometimes you ask us questions that touch into research that we might have done some time ago, and we wouldn't have actually have put those two things together necessarily before. So, you know, you also give us uh, – frequently, you give us another exercise in joining dots through prehistory, which is mm -hmm. really useful. You know, it, mm -hmm. uh, it does happen quite a lot. And there's a few of those tonight. It, we're not under the illusion that if we're answering questions, we're giving definitive answers. Um, we're as opinionated as the next <laughs> person. <laughs> but uh, we do try to deal in, in facts, you know, that, uh, you know, whatever, talk, uh, however we work our way around a subject, hopefully it's, a, it's an informed working our way around so uh, yeah i'm so glad to see you all i've said enough about that anything else uh, to mention before we kick off uh, rupert i mean do you know I, I, not really i think that um as you said <laughs> earlier on this is it's actually a really good mixture of questions tonight so um, yeah. no it's gonna be fun you, you know it's been a test for for, for my brain because there's a lots of uh, uh, topics you know that get sucked into these are not simple questions these are talking points you know and that's the mm. that's the idea so one thing before we kick off <clears throat> the questions that we're going to be answering okay. are questions that have been asked of us in the last month or so, so by people who've posted um on the placeholder we keep in the uh, community um thing that that goes on uh, we'll do our best to keep an eye on the chat but we certainly can't guarantee to uh, respond to everything and uh, we will be favoring the questions that are previous that uh, we've already been asked if a really good question comes up in the chat and we, and we notice it we'll do our best to incorporate it but we've got 10 big questions tonight and yeah. uh, time flies do you know what uh, if if you don't mind, Mike, um, yep. I think there's there's well one other thing that I think we should mention, apart from saying hello, Dale, nice to see you, um, that um, <clears throat> uh, moving forwards, we're actually uh, we're doing more regular uh, stuff. Uh, we, we've just been replanning how we're going to do stuff. The Q&A still stands. 
yeah. but we are going to be doing our regular Patreon uh, live. So for our crew members, uh, people who are with us on Patreon, uh, we're still doing a live broadcast to uh, to them um, at the beginning of the month. And then we're doing a prehistory show, which is for those of you that have seen, we've, we've done them at odd times before, but we're actually going to be doing them live now every month. Um, and that's going to be a mixture of uh, news items and topic of conversation. We will every now and again, I mean, it might be every month, but certainly every now and again, we'll be bringing on special guests to uh, spend the show with us and chat about stuff, you know, different archaeologists, what have you. Uh, yeah, stuff like that. So, and, and then the Q&A uh, as well. So there's going to be three main things that we're going to be doing every month as we move forwards. thought it was yeah. worth throwing that in. Some of you may have noticed that um, <clears throat> we haven't been popping up that often. <clears throat> there hasn't been that much content coming to the site, all sorts of reasons, but our plan is to um, vastly increase the uh, the content coming to you. So We've had stuff going on. In the Mike's just moved house. Let's not go there. Let's not <laughs> Let's go not, there. No. And actually get on with uh, answering a few questions, shall we? Let's do it, yes. Shall we, uh, shall we go to the first question? Do it. Okay, here we go. It's from Martha, Martha Clement. Hello, Martha. And um, Martha asks, uh, any thoughts regarding the earliest use of horses for draft or riding? There appears to be some controversy surrounding the dating of some ancient Iranian cave art. <laughs> So, uh, what has the dating of some ancient Iranian cave art got to do with the earliest use of horses? I hear you ask. Um, Indeed, can you yes. Bring um, that together, Rupert. Uh, yes. Well, I, I think the the honest thing to do is to answer the main question straight off: the earliest known use of horses for um, uh, certainly for riding is 6,000 years ago, and it's from the Eurasian steppe. Uh, there's, uh, there's a wealth of evidence that, um, uh, that people were riding horses in the Eurasian steppe and, and, you know, and well into the north. Uh, and then from that point onwards, there's loads of evidence, uh, certainly going through the Bronze Age of chariots and all sorts of stuff. Now, the controversy that Martha is mentioning about the uh, Iranian cave art is that there are petroglyphs and uh, pictographs or pictograms. Is it a pictograph or a pictogram? Um, that show particularly Ooh, I might have a picture. Like, Hold on a second. I beg your pardon? I said I might have a picture. There we go. Oh, well done. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, the the problem with any kind of cave art uh, or rock art, let's not say cave art, let's say rock art, uh, is that because we're seeing them after the event. Uh, so, uh, you know, we've got, say, cup and ring markings in uh, various places in Scotland, uh, Achenabrek being the one that immediately springs to mind. These amazingly complex large areas of rock all beautifully carved with cup and ring markings. And we look at it as if it was conceived as a piece of art like that, mm. uh, without taking into account that actually that could have been pecked away by different people over many, many generations. <clears throat> it, you know, it could have been a cultural thing that people just added to it over even thousands of years. We mm. don't know. And so the same thing applies here with these, uh, there's a wealth of, uh, of, of these illustrations, if you like, in Iranian cave art, that uh, some of them are of, uh, you know, species, there's a lot of ibex, for example, uh, wild goats. Uh, now, uh, the thing is that a lot of these paint, uh, pictographs they go back they might be 30,000 years old 40,000 years old uh, but again people are looking at all these pictures and thinking that they must all date to the same time but there are pictures of people on horseback like the one that Mike's <laughs> just put up there yeah. um, uh, and in fact there's uh, there's another one 
that's uh, that's along with uh, drawings of ibex, for example, that is very clearly a man uh, leading a horse. There's a there's a uh, there's a, oh, right. uh, okay. a man there's a man on the horse, yeah. but there is a man leading the horse by the bridle. Um, uh, you know, so it's very you can tell that it's modern in comparison with the things alongside. Yeah. Uh, so it, f- for us, that's the, the answer that you have to, you, you can't see these things as single moments in time. Well, it, get, it gets more complicated than that. Well, not even complicated. It, 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 it's, it's a little bit simpler in many ways that the span of dates that are put on um, cave art uh, in Iran stretches from uh, 40,000 to 4,000 BC. Um, mm. And the, the uh, image from the uh, uh, Dusha, Dusha cave in, in Iran, um, that has had the date of 15,000 BC put on it. Now, don't want to get into politics and, and all the rest of it, but there's a huge problem because that dating is fairly arbitrary. Um, and... <laughs> The, a lot of these stuff is um, how sh- how should we say it's uh, propagandist slightly because mm. of a of a tendency to want to make uh, you know the area seem ahead of everybody else. Mm. And the huge problem is I think there was a, a team of researchers that were going there to uh, date, do some dating on the cave site. But the dating equipment that they had to bring with them, I think it was a Norwegian team, couldn't be allowed into the country uh, as the uranium dating stuff because of U.S. sanctions. So (laughs) Iran... You have to laugh, have you? (laughs) No. uh, Uranium-thorium dating is illegal. That's right. (laughs) In in Iran, because, (laughs) because of U.S. sanctions. So uh, Iranian archaeologists can't use the up-to-date techniques to date these things uh, anyway. Uh, so you pays your money and you takes your choice. You know, who, who do you believe in, in these matters? So long-winded mm. way of saying nobody knows really what the date's on that kind of uh, mm. you know, th- this particular uh, image is. I and think if you're going to it, be... If you're going to be very open-eyed about it, then, um, I, I, Mike, is that is that um, uh, is that the only picture that we have? Of uh, did you get any of the others? Um, I'm thinking of the ibex that are you know that are pecked. No, are, no, I didn't. No, it doesn't matter. Just, just yeah, about it, the folks, if you Google, um, uh, if you just do a search for uh, Iranian cave art controversy something like that you know it, it will come yeah. up you'll get all this because there is so much of it but you can see you know if you look at the style of that illustration of a man mm. on a horse and compare that with the uh, cave uh, with the uh, the illustrations of wild animals that are uh, you know alongside in the same caves and uh, around and about you can see that it's a completely different mindset behind the art you know they're just they're, there is just such a gulf of time between them um so yeah it's uh, it does that, uh, are we answering the question there i think that's the important thing is is well, you, you it, with any rock art is not to see it in a single time frame yeah, yeah. I mean, you gave the straightest answer to the question uh, at the top there. You know, what is known is, mm. uh, you know, 6, the Eurasian, Eurasian yeah. steppe, 6,000 years. Yeah. Also, though, uh, I don't know the details of this, but it's also worthwhile doing a search on um, early horse, uh, domestic horse usage in uh, Ukraine. That seems to have a, a parallel um, dating and to the Kazakhstan um, dates for early horse mm-hmm. usage. So that's an interesting development. I think yeah. that one's based around DNA as well. Mm-hmm. There, there are some it, interesting... Well, I, I, yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? I think it's something that we should always bear in mind with any of these aspects of archaeology that, uh, that, that these days we tend to hear... 
uh, reports, you know, a new discovery has been made in this country or that country. Whereas, you know, go back uh, five, six, seven thousand years, whatever the time frame may be, those country boundaries were not there. They didn't exist. And so to look at a landmass, you know, I mean, Mike's just mentioned Ukraine. Uh, we're, we're talking about uh, the Eurasian steppe. There is so much uh, uh, prehistory of horsemanship in Mongolia, Siberia. But but the thing is that if you look at that as a landmass without the modern country boundaries that we take for granted, then it shouldn't surprise any of us that uh, that people are using horses across that uh, huge tranche of uh, uh, yeah. of Asia. Yeah, yeah. Mm. It's a highly detailed subject, though, and there are many sources out there uh, if you if you mm. search around on on Google. But uh, watch out for the dates; they may not be what they seem. Mm. Uh, okay, so that's that for the moment. Um, Hope that's question. answered your question, Martha. Yeah, well, in a sort of way. Okay. Um, <laughs> I hope I uh, that may be close. I don't know. What's your uh, What's your best bet on? Uh, hey, honoring... listen. I just I, I just offend people when I try Welsh, so I'm not even going there. Um... <laughs> Thank but you for the question. Got... Anyway, yes. Um, um, let, me I, I... <laughs> let me read it. Let me read it. Um, mm. We quite often hear about Doggerland and that it may have been a refuge per, for prehistoric North Europeans, but we never hear about the vast tracts of land on the western and southern sides of Britain and Ireland. I once read that it would have been possible to walk from Brittany to Ireland along a coastline that is now hundreds of miles offshore. Surely these areas would have had milder climates due to their proximity to the, to the Atlantic and would have supported equally or possibly larger populations than Doggerland. Do you guys have any, any information on these areas, or could you suggest any studies into it? Thanks. Mm -hmm. It's a lovely question. It um, is. Mm, good one. Uh, uh, yes. Okay, well, the simple... Uh, the, the, okay, the first answer is... Yes, you could indeed. If you go back to the Mesolithic, you could walk all the way from Spain, actually. You could walk all yeah, the yeah. way from Spain uh, right up to the west coast of Ireland. No problem at all. It was all dry land. Um, Population-wise, if you're asking about, you know, could it have supported equally or possibly? Would we? Probably. But the thing is that there, there weren't that uh, those levels of population. Uh, back then. Uh, so whilst it's true that it could have supported people, and there were undoubtedly people uh, living there, but in terms of large populations, um, there's no way of knowing because there's no excavations being done. Okay, you know, some excavations have been done in Doggerland itself, uh, so to the east, um, in the North Sea, and uh, and there's evidence of uh, of you know a certain amount of human activity, um, so it, it, certainly they would have been there, but no mm. excavations have been done out in open ocean. So um, sure. Well, yeah. should, should we get clarity a little bit more clarity for people and uh, get the map yeah. up? Uh, see if that's there. Yeah, it should be happening. Oh, let's do the whole screen. There we go. Um, yeah, um, so there you have what we're talking about. Um, uh, Doggerland uh, in the interim between the, the Netherlands and uh, the east coast of Britain and the uh, mm. uh, area under discussion here over to the west, extending to that lighter green uh, area mm. and what was possibly going on there. And yeah, the problem... It is with, uh, I mean, let me go back to, um, so we can see uh, the question. Hold on a second. Get under control. Um, yeah, do we guys have any information on these areas? Could you suggest any studies into it? And there's a huge problem because there is no data from a, that kind of point of view, from an archaeological point of view, for that whole area 
uh, now mm. under the sea. The advantage that Doggerland has is that nowadays it is still relatively shallow. Um, mm. Out to the west, it is still quite deep. And you've got to ask the question is whether the, uh, Doggerland would be under such investigation now if that harpoon had not been dredged up by a trawler. Um, it was quite some time ago, wasn't it? I've forgotten. It's the nearly 100 years ago now, wasn't it? It's, yeah. it's a long time ago. Uh, a long yeah. time ago, you know, which immediately mm. says, oh, well, there were human beings here. We don't have anything mm. like that at all. There was mm. zilch, nothing archaeological from mm. um, the, those Western areas. Mm. I don't doubt for a moment that there were it, they were peopled, but mm. we can't go looking for them because there's... Yeah, you, know, you you couldn't possibly raise the funding to go looking speculatively. Yeah. I mean, it'd be I think phenomenally it, it, expensive. <laughs> it's true. It would. It's it's worth pointing out. Actually, I I just want to pull up um a uh, Ralph Ellis. Hello, Ralph. Um, uh, Ralph has said uh, there are many petrified forests off the coast of Wales. Very large trees too. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good point. Um, and uh, and I think it might be. You know, if if you really want to. Uh, get as much background on this as possible it, it, you'd probably get more information if you uh if you researched it from a geological point of view than an anthropological point of view mm. um you'll certainly get more information about the land masses mm. uh really um but i i, I dare say as uh, as things move forwards uh you know in time I mean, you know vince gaffney for example some of you mm. will know professor um Vince Gaffney, is he OBE or MBE? Oh God! I think, Sorry, I think Vince. He, one or the other. Um, he's uh, he's one of our finest. Um, and and Vince, um, in fact, Vince is half the reason that we have so much modern archaeological technology today. Anyway, from yeah. the point of view of uh, magnetometry and what have you, it's whatever just, he is, I think it's, it's OBE. Um, but uh, he, he he's got something his, BE. Um, yeah, you got uh, that. Not for just being an, an extraordinary archaeologist, but but for bit for pioneering remote sensing. Mm. When you hear about uh, lidar, mm. uh, ground penetrating radar. He's the man that mm. uh, has really brought it to the fore and made it uh, ubiquitous. Yeah, in Vince, yeah. a total genius. That mm. uh, they wanted to explore Doggerland. And it was Vince who thought that all the oil companies, they're just looking for oil. And Vince thought, wow, it would cost us a fortune to go uh, trying to do this sort of research. The oil companies have already done it. And the oil companies said, well, we don't have any information that you'd want. And, and Vince was saying, that's exactly the information we, we, that we want, the stuff that you don't give a damn about. You know, mm -hmm. we don't care about the oil. We just want to know what's at the bottom of the sea. And uh, they got all this information that was just rubbish information for the oil companies. Um, mm. And uh, so, yeah, uh, Vince is is very much responsible for a huge amount of the knowledge that we have of uh, of Doggerland. Mm. MBE, mm. Nick, thank or you very hail. much indeed. Uh, it, apparently it's MBE, I was wrong. Thank you, Nick. Thank uh, you. <laughs> uh, I, hope mm. I hope that's the only time I'm wrong tonight. Say that again. You blipped. For I me. said. I, I hope. I hope that's the else. only time I'm wrong tonight. About uh, Vince's, uh, <laughs> jolly good. Obi. Uh, thank you, uh, Maison du Suave. <laughs> um, Duffet Archaeology. They have a good presentation of early geology and sunken Western era. Okay, that's uh, that's a good. Amber, one you're a complete you and much. utter star. Thank you so much. Bless you. Yay. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Amber. Mm. <laughs> thank you uh, very much. Okay. Shall we get the next question up? Uh, yes. Did we, yeah, that, was, that was best we could do, I think. Hold on. I need to go back to this. It's a good job I know what I'm doing, isn't it? Here we go. <laughs> uh, David Garcia. Hi there. Hello, David. Hi there, David. Uh, what are the origins of whaling? I am curious. And when did whaling really begin in Europe or in Eurasia in general? 
especially the encounters of, uh, of whales from Paleolithic and Mesolithic peoples during that time. And what was their perception of whales during ancient times with legends like uh, the great fish who swallowed Jonah to Cetus of Greco-Roman myth? Um, mm. It's very difficult to you know, link that end bit up with being in the realms of, of prehistory, but um, maybe we can touch on that a little bit later on in the answer. So this was a difficult one to nail down, and I wouldn't pretend that we have uh, kind of nailed it down, but we know where to, where to look, don't we? We do. Uh, we do. There are... <laughs> Uh, do you know what? There are so many really intriguing things about this. You ask about whaling. Mm. Well, there, there's plenty of evidence of uh, people's, um, let's say, awareness of whales. So you can go to Morbihan, for example, um, off the coast of uh, Brittany, where uh, some of the art in caves, you know, there are depictions of whales, spouting whales. Um, now, those are illustrations of whales. They're not illustrations of whaling. Um, mm. so, um, so, you know, that in itself uh, uh, doesn't necessarily connect. But we do know that uh, the Inuit have been uh, whaling for how many thousand years is it, Mike? Um, is it four? Four thousand, Or four thousand yeah. BC, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and, well, I'll, uh, I'll uh, actually let me uh, let me just uh, share a screen there. Yeah, there's a there's a, a web article, uh, and this was a, a, a nice find, actually, uh, looking for something that's actually specific about uh, the known date of evidence of whaling, um, and uh, it is the in Inuit of uh, of Greenland, uh, and. They nailed it through the presence of uh, DNA uh, in um, um, in middens. You know, so mm. there's no question about it. The the bowhead whale figured really heavily in the uh, in the diet of. Uh, um, as the, that's what the uh, it actually the article actually looks like in real life. There you go. Uh, at Science Nordic, I tell you what, I'll get the um, I'll get the the. Um, link for that, and I'll just put it in the uh, put it in the chat if anybody's interested. There we go. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's nice nice to be able to you know put a sort of four thousand um, before before present uh, date on that. But the question is, goodness knows how long the Inuit uh, had been doing it before that. Mm. I mean, very, very ancient mm. uh, and people. And this whole question came it, up for us. Sorry, Rupert. No, that's all right. I was just going to say it's, it's a good point to make um, across the board in prehistory that whenever yeah. there is an established date, then all you can ever say is that that's the earliest known. You can't say that that's when they started. It's just it's the, it's the earliest date that we can actually pinpoint. They mm. they could have been doing it for quite a while before that, yeah. and they very probably were. Uh, it, so it's that it's, it, that's as far back as we can say with a hundred percent certainty. Yeah, um, but I remember it floating into our minds uh, very early on when we were talking to Bruce uh, Bruce um, Bradley about the Salutrian hypothesis, and yes, you know, I mean if people were moving round. Uh, the ice coast, if I say if, uh, you know, mm, uh, they did across the uh, North Atlantic. Yes. There, uh, bet your bottom dollar they would have been sustaining themselves, you know, with you know the fatty substance of uh, those coastal waters, and be in mm. no doubt uh, about the skills of uh, the Inuit and uh, indigenous peoples who were used to sailing in those particular kinds of waters. Um, they they can harpoon large whales with relatively, you know, uh, small and seemingly uh, lightweight boats. Um, mm. It's quite an extraordinary thing. So it's not that you need a huge whaling ship uh, to be able to do this thing. Um, so yeah, men have been doing it for quite some time. The only other thing mm. I came. Um, up 
with. Uh, I've also found to do with whaling, that brings us much more recent. This is only, uh, um, where are we? Five, oops, this is only five, wrong thing. Uh, this is only, uh, 500 uh, BC, and this is... It's 500 uh, AD. 500, um, 500 AD, I beg its pardon. From yeah. Chile, yeah. Um, so a dramatic whale hunts depicted in ancient rock art. And there we mm. have... Uh, but the, yeah. Yes, yeah, fantastic, yeah, isn't it? Stuff on the inside of a, of a rock. Mm. And one with a harpoon actually sticking out of his mm. side. So, uh, yeah, not my favourite subject, whaling. <laughs> no, but equally, you know, it, it, I think it, it illustrates the point that we, because these days, in the developed world anyway, mm. we don't really engage <clears throat> with hunting. You know, we rely on the fact that we can go down to the supermarket or the butchers and buy everything that's already dealt with for us. And so we get the impression that going out and catching a whale would be this ridiculously monumental task when the reality is that if you've got enough harpoons and you can uh, wound the whale in the most significant places, then you don't have to try pulling it in. You can wait until it's exhausted from... Uh, from the battle you know it's uh, and then tow it in you don't actually have to be fighting it uh, we're just so divorced from that kind of animal let's just say hunting i was uh... <laughs> sorry i was yeah. uh, fid fiddling away trying to make sure that uh, graham's question could be seen because the font was too dark for the screen uh, Graham oh, okay. says most would have washed ashore after a natural death uh, question mark, and that is a question. Um, apparently, in that study, I'll go go back to it um, in Science, Science Nordic uh, about the Inuit hunted whales four thousand years ago. Mm. It did answer that question, um, and the answer is no. They, they, these were hunted because of the density. The, the, it, you can't base your sustenance off the occasional uh, washing up uh, of a whale. These people are living off whale, pretty much. Uh, that's what they got from the midden and the uh, DNA uh, analysis. So it was too concentrated for it to be um, uh, con <laughs> depending upon contingency. It's uh, mm. no way to survive depending on, on luck. You've got to be uh, out there mm -hmm. doing it. So I think the answer to the question there, Graham, is, is no, they were, you know, they were a, a wash up I on the beach I, I, would I, be nice, but I don't think that's what they were doing. I, I want to touch on another point here. Uh, Lily, uh, uh, Lily Shambles has made a oh, nice point. She says, oh. maybe folks only eat whales in times of desperation as apparently the meat stinks. Uh, and and the thing is that that it's another aspect of the developed world that we have now cultivated a real problem with smells. You know, yeah. if somebody has got BO, for example, we recoil in horror and think that they're a dirty so-and-so who needs a good shower. Whereas you go back... <laughs> It, in fact, not that many hundreds of years ago. Can you imagine the stench inside a regular tavern? Good grief, it must have been incandescent. Um, and uh, you still get to this day, you get, I think it's on the Faroe Islands, where uh, they use nets to catch the migrating seabirds. They just literally scoop them out of the air. And they put all the dead birds... Uh, they put in a pile and cover with a mound of, uh, of, of effectively a can. They just cover them with uh, with stones. And then they come back for them six months later as food. Oh. Oh, and wow. they are absolutely rancid, rotten meat. I can't remember who it was who did a documentary about this uh, some years ago. And uh, the, <laughs> the researcher was just gagging at being presented 
associated with this uh, with this food to eat. It was truly, truly disgusting, and for them, it's a delicacy. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think again, you know, we have to maybe count our blessings, or maybe it's the other way around that we're just so divorced from the realities of that's all you've got to eat. I don't care if it stinks, put up with it. There's nothing mm. else. Mm. Um, mm. But it, but I, I don't, there's a discussion going on about you know opportunistic hunting. I don't think it was even opportunistic. You know they knew what they were doing. They were planning. Uh, they were going out. They were not waiting for mm. uh, oppor- uh, the whales to come close to the shore or anything like that, as they ha- still do now and up to fairly recently. I think that's the point. Mm. Is that this isn't um, supposition? I think if you look around, there's old old film of uh, of the Inuit going out in their flimsy boats, you know, and, and, yeah. and tackling these giants uh, and bringing them yeah. home. It's quite quite extraordinary. They don't need to yeah. wait for stuff to happen. They can cause it. Uh, I- yeah, I mean, we uh, again, we just uh, it's the same with megalith building and anything like that. We look at stuff that it looks a little bit tricky and we think that people must have shied away from it, but mm. they just mm. didn't. It was, mm. you know, there was no automation in anything, so they just got stuck in. Uh, we did an article, crikey, it was probably two years ago now um that was about a cave in southeast asia and i can't remember the name of the island uh, off the top of my head i'd have to go and look it up but um in a cave on this island they found evidence for the people who had been living there however many thousands of years ago had been going out in small boats and catching deep sea fish um uh, so, uh, you know, they, they weren't just fishing from the shore and getting stuff that was easy to catch. Mm. I'm not obviously talking about whales here, but the, but the thing is that it was still just a cultural norm. Uh, you know, they would go out and fish for wherever they were going to get uh, the greatest return on investment. You know, the, and let's face it, the bigger the animal you can catch and bring back, the the less you have to do for the next week or two, whatever. So that only takes us back to uh, 4,000 years ago. Uh, yeah. If you want to go back to 4,000 BC, and I'm doing this the clumsy way by just dragging this onto the screen. There we go. That is a sort of schematic. Oh, represents. Gosh, sorry, clunky. Uh, that is one of the men here's um, uh, near Gavrinis. Mm-hmm. Brittany in the Morbihan region, near the coast there, uh, and that is, I think that, that is actually the Grand Menia, the one that's tumbled over. You can tell the it's one that's pretty big, broken in pieces. Yeah, but you yeah. see where the five meter mark is, mm. right? And up on the second piece, I don't know if it's upright or well, it's, a, but that is reckoned to be a depiction of a sperm whale. Mm. Now. It doesn't tell us whether they were hunting them or not. Uh, certainly tells them they were noticing them uh, mm. uh, enough. Um, yeah, sperm whale with the 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 the, 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 sp- the sp- spout spout. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, and and, oh, and the, the other stone. Uh, the other, st- of them the other stone. As well. Sorry, the other stone is inside a tomb. I think it's the. Uh, I think it's carved on the inside of the roof of a huge tomb table de mosh yes i'm pretty sure that there's more than one i think there's one on the back wall of one of the tombs as well yeah yeah i just thought um, i brought that up you know just to put it back into uh, into prehistory and all which we always mm. like to do <laughs> yes we do <laughs> <laughs> enough Enough. Yes, we do. Uh, let us let us go to uh, hopefully the next question. Ah, Steve, oh, I think you're there in the chat. Aren't you? Steve, oh, Steve, oh, Robbo. Uh, we kind of answered this question before in a uh, a, a Monday moot we did for our Patreon folk. Um, we did a yeah, whole thing did. about true, yeah. uh, vandalism. But anyway, the question is: Does this happen often in modern times? 
by the I'll show you what he means by this in a moment. I'm aware that people have chipped away souvenirs from various stones over the centuries, but how do we behave now? Also, what is your opinion on such things? Many of my favourite ways in connecting with the past is seeing old graffiti like the Vikings' runes at Mays Howe. These were once modern graffiti. And if I can just illustrate, which is the whole point, uh, what uh, Steve-O was trying to show us. Uh, no, that's not the one. <laughs> that is. <laughs> Uh, is I think uh, the link that um, uh, that uh, Steve gave was this to uh, the BBC website and the report. Um, what's the date on that? Eleventh of May. Uh, some graffiti carved on uh, Machrymore standing stones. Um, that's uh, uh, one of the stones there, and that there is the actual graffiti that was. Um, Put upon it. Mm. So the question is, does this happen very often nowadays? Compared, you know, to the past, you know, acknowledging that you know well, it doesn't just happen now. It was, uh, but it, but it, it it's happened forever. I, the, yeah. the thing is that we no longer make monuments like that. But if you take into account uh, any monumental building. So let's say Ooh. a school, let's say mm. a school. Uh, now, how many of us as children uh, carved our initials into uh, the stone wall at the back of the playground or um, yeah, certainly in a desk? Um, you know, it's something that we do. You go onto the roofs of churches where people have gone up there and carved their initials, uh, you know, into the, uh, the, the, the lead and the, um, you know, the roofing people have done it forever. And mm. it looks horrendous when we see it, you know, it is vandalism, but, but where do we draw the line of vandalism? Because it's part of the history of the site. I'm not saying I approve of it, I have to <laughs> say, but, but the thing is that, uh, so, for example, we know about at Stonehenge itself, there are carvings on uh, on some of the stones. There's uh, there's carvings of axe heads, for example. We have no idea whether they were done at the time and relevant to the site at the time. It could have been someone coming along and vandalising it because they fancied carving an axe on it. Um, it you know, there, there's a curious thing about. When something in history, it becomes romantic, you know, why? When it is just vandalism, uh, uh, you, you know, you, you mentioned the Viking graffiti at Mays Howe. Wanton graffiti going into a burial chamber, so what was a sacred place, and carving graffiti about who did what to whose wife. Um, you know, that's, that's clearly graffiti. Yet today, because we're looking at something that is a thousand years old, or I don't actually know how old, I don't remember how old that Viking graffiti is, but, you know, centuries old. And suddenly it's it's romantic and, uh, uh, you know, it, it's uh, evocative. Uh, it's certainly a large part of, if you do the Maze How tour, it's certainly a large part of what the the guide points out while you're in there hmm. with his or her torch <laughs> hmm. uh, declining See, it, to translate it, it's a really interesting thing that there's down in, in devon um in uh, southwest england um there's uh, a place called uh, there's a, a village called village it's a little town called beer mm. and the beer quarry caves produce some of the finest limestone ever uh st paul's cathedral uh i think westminster abbey as well they're, they're actually built from limestone from the beer quarry caves um now if you go to the beer quarry caves that's b-e-r-e -E, by the way in case anybody's wondering it's on the south coast B -E -R -E. oh it's not no it's not oh, it's, no, it's b-e-e-r -E -E as in pint of beer -E -R. yes where's yes there is, is. A, there is a beer E there is a beer. Don't know where that is not, though. Uh, but, but no, right. beer it's, as in it, it, pint of beer. Be, yeah. um, 
And if you go to the Beer Quarry Caves, then uh, what is really evocative about this is that at the entrance to the caves, they were started by the Romans. And so you look at the entrance to these quarries and it's all Roman pick marks and tool marks. And you go into the quarries and it's like deep tunnels underground. And as you move deeper into the uh, the tunnels, obviously you're moving forwards in time. And you can see that the pick marks and the tool marks all change and the graffiti changes. So you've got something from, you know, that you know, John Smith wrote in 1726 saying, good God, I need a piss or, or you know, or whatever, that total graffiti and some of it is hysterically rude. Um, but uh, again, absolute graffiti at the time. And yet going in now centuries afterwards, and it's just it's almost like you can hold hands across uh, across the centuries. Mm. So, I, yeah, it, it's a difficult one. You know, the, the, all the emotions around graffiti is it is vandalism, but yeah. mm. the full Irish Irish galley, Gary uh, visiting <laughs> okay. the Irish uh, prehistory sites. It's a huge problem here in Ireland. Visita visitors taking small stones from the inside of open cairns. Uh, well. Talking of people taking uh, small stones or chips away from something, uh, have a look at this. Anybody recognise that? So, Rupert, tell us what we're looking at there. Yeah, what we're looking at now is, uh, so the King's Stone, which is the outlier of the Rollwright Stones in Oxfordshire, uh, the King's Stone is uh, is the largest stone associated with the site, and if you is that the uh, what what's furthest to the left, Mike? What's the date on the furthest to the left? Yeah, there we go. So uh, basically, these are, so there you go. That's six, sixteen oh seven. So uh, these are illustrations uh, drawn over uh, a few hundred years. Uh, of how the shape of the cha of the stone changed when whether they were pilgrims or travelers you know that people uh, knocked away pieces of the stone to take away as uh, as talismans um and it it changed its shape completely mm. from people robbing uh, a little piece uh, every time that, that they've passed yeah. it. And so, that's, that's, uh, you, so you, you look at that what bizarre looks. shape now, yeah. and uh, uh, it, it just goes to show that what, once people start doing a thing, then the next person along goes, oh, just knock another bit off the same place. And <laughs> gradually, yeah. it's gradually a, it's you're a, left it's with a this. wonderfully evocative shape now, you know, and you think, mm. oh, this, what it, wonder what it meant to them back then. It didn't mean anything to them, back, not in that shape. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it, isn't it funny how, you know, we would automatically make that assumption that they chose that stone deliberately because it looked like a bent over old man or, you know, whatever. Yeah. And uh, no, 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 that's all happened in the last few hundred years. Uh, you um, only have to go back 500 years and that stone was not distorted at all. Yeah. Going back to uh, Steve-O's questions uh, a bit, though. <clears throat> uh, how do we behave now? How we behave now, I mean, let's take basic just around the ancient sites. The behaviour must have modif been modified quite considerably by the fact that uh, gradually ancient monuments came uh, under the protection of the government. Mm. Um, they became protected sites and it became a serious... It is, it is a serious offence to deface or put graffiti on or uh, otherwise uh, uh, um, damage uh, one of our sites. Um, so that must have a, a chilling effect, we hope, uh, I don't know if the uh, sites in in Ireland I mean, they must do fall under the same kind of uh, regime. Um, mm. Yay! I don't think there's uh, quite anything more. To, I can't think of any other examples. I mean, uh, going back to the Rollwright stones, they were 
covered in yellow paint to her, which was ghastly. Mm. Yeah, some... Well, there was there was paint daubed on uh, Ring of Brodger uh, last year or the year before as well. Um, mm -hmm. That um, yeah. Oh, it, go, going going back to uh, it's, look. <laughs> Why are those railings yeah. there? To stop people doing this. Because <laughs> they are going to keep doing it. Yeah. It's no it's, question. Yeah. Um, I, I, was, I was telling Mike the other day, I think one of the most um, uh, beautiful and evocative pieces of graffiti, because you have to call it that, that I've ever seen, uh, is in, uh, I think it's in Bushy Park. Uh, and do you know what? It is in Bushy Park. It's in the Woodland Gardens in Bushy Park. There's an oak tree, and uh, if you look up about 20 or so feet off the ground on the side of this tree, there is a big, distorted heart, uh, and there's initials on either side of it that you can no longer read because of the distortion. But uh, oh, yeah. you've got this heart that's this kind of size, and you think, that well, that was carved hundreds of years ago, when uh, that, you know, it's now 20 feet or so up there, and this was down when it was only three or four feet off the ground, and some bloke was carving, you know, I love so-and-so and doing a little heart with his, uh, with his pen knife. And over the centuries, it's now, you know, become this huge distorted thing that you can no longer read the initials. But you can see that somebody did that. Um, and... Yes, I yes, that's graffiti or vandalism, but also, isn't that a beautiful thing? <laughs> you know, so it's it's oh, it's a difficult thing. It's a difficult one. Vandalism and graffiti. What what's mm. the motivation behind it? I think if you're declaring your 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 love for somebody <laughs> yeah, to to last for eternity, that's one thing. It's a very different thing from daubing yellow paint on the roll right stones just because you want to uh, make a mess of it. It's not the same mentality at all, is it? I was it? going to say, but uh, Kevin just reminded me, we managed to get a, get through a whole question about a graffiti on ancient stones without mentioning the Cochno stone. <laughs> yeah, good point, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. I, we, we, I, I think time is a bit short, so we won't go there now, but it's a fascinating subject, and uh, we can direct you to uh, mm. s seek out Kenny Brophy. You'll find um, the um, urban prehistorian. And also, uh, if you search uh, for our interview with Kenny Brophy on YouTube, he tells the story of the Cochno Stone uh, and an extraordinary example of uh, what would we now we would now seem as vandalism, which actually took place under the auspices of archaeology. Yes, yes, Look, the archaeologist Lud Ludovic Mann. Ludovic Mann. Uh, let, let, let's just say he overstepped the mark. Mark a little bit. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh uh, dear. <laughs> Uh, excuse me, I spotted a question and I wanted to answer it and now I've lost it. And I think, uh, Lord, it was from, sorry, talk amongst yourselves. Uh, there's a lot of chat I tell you about uh, fermenting foods and uh, uh, 101 things to do with whale blubber. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, I seem to have lost it. I'm so sorry. Somebody asked a direct question about recommendations uh, for for a site, and I thought it worthwhile uh, maybe having a stab at that. It, I can't find it now. C could you repeat the question? Because um, I'm scrolling up and down and I'm missing it completely. Uh, yeah. Uh, in the meantime... Uh, um, a, a couple of people have said... Yeah. Uh, I know Kevin said it once, and... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, who else said it? Um, but uh, uh, yes, Mike and I are dreadful salespeople um, or self-marketers. Please do hit the like button and, and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Um, it, mm. Obviously, only click like if you like what we're doing. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
Um, <laughs> but yeah, do subscribe. You know, the more our numbers grow, then the more it, uh, you know, uh, YouTube oh, actually. And yeah. while we're in that vein, down below, you'll see links to our Patreon site. Uh, if you're enjoying yeah. what we're doing here, um, that's a good way of uh, helping yeah. us keep yeah, going. And, uh, and also joining in with uh, a lot of the community, some of whom, quite a few of whom, are in the chat already here. You can see what a jolly bunch yes, they are. So they are yeah, a jolly um, <laughs> on Patreon, there's um, uh, yeah behind the scenes because we don't just do this. People who don't know us, we don't just do this. We mm. have been known for making films. We haven't made very many in the last <laughs> year. <laughs> yeah, we have been known for making films. That is true. Uh, <laughs> uh, in fact, we're, we are just about to make another one uh, in yeah, two yeah. weeks' I mean, time. We will be filming. Uh, yes, making a film. We are making a film in the Cotswolds about the Cotswold yeah. Seven Long Barrows, which is a fasc fascinating topic. I won't sell that right now, but we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for our film Standing with Stones. We wouldn't be doing this it's now true. if it wasn't for Standing with Stones. Um, true. Yeah. So thank you, yeah. Kevin. <laughs> uh, so anyway, if you want the behind the scenes stuff on, on that and uh, keeping up to date with us and uh, being with these glorious people uh, on the, in the Patreon community. Have a look at that link. If, um, on the other hand, you know, you like what we do and you want to sort of throw something in the tip jar, we have a, um, a Buy Me A Coffee campaign going on as, as well. Uh, and the funds from the Buy Me A Coffee campaign go directly towards our filmmaking. So that's, uh, that's mm. ring-fenced and, and goes uh, to, towards our filmmaking. Patreon pays for the day-to-day. -day. <laughs> mm. Well... Almost. <laughs> yes. We yeah, need more that. of you. It's no question yeah, we about do. it. But we're, we, Less, yes, but you make, you make a huge difference to us. You really do. Um, yes. Cool. Okay. Have oh, we answered that? Should we move on? What? No, I remember now. It was about other uh, ancient monuments in Cheshire. 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 Yes. Well, there's going to be. Um, well, you're going to do that, are you? <laughs> uh for, Cheshire. It's tough we didn't off the film top of in Cheshire, did we? No, no. Uh, we didn't film in Cheshire. No, because it it does thin out. That's not to say that. Uh, I think there are probably it's fair to say there are a fair few in reach of Cheshire. Um, mm. But but Cheshire itself is a is a tough one. You know, you go um, go east into uh, uh, Somerset, you're good, and go west into Devon, you're good. Um, <laughs> But uh, Cheshire there itself are, is a toughie. Uh, the Bride Stones. Okay. Uh, the, the Bull Stones. Okay. Um, there's not going to be many from that yeah, part of the world. Uh, but Roman um, stuff. Highwayman Stone. Don't know how old that is. Um, uh, do you know what? We'll give a heads up to um, Andy, who runs uh, megalithic.co.uk. Oh, yeah. If you, uh, if you go to megalithic.co.uk, it's a fantastic resource. That and the Modern Antiquarian. They're the, well, I'll be they're showing the, two... the website later on as we come to uh, yeah, the question um, about... Uh... Uh, they're, they're the two best websites if you if you want to search mm. for um, megaliths, really, in uh, mostly megaliths in prehistory. I'll, I'll tell you prehistory. what, I'll put up... Um, and uh, and I, I'm just looking now at Andy's site, megalithic.co.uk, and he's he's got a, a few sites there listed for Cheshire. Um, I, uh, I yeah, I recommend both those sites very highly if you if you're looking for stuff. Yeah, what were you saying? David has just reminded us we were going to mention this. Can you see that, Rupert? David uh, is asking. Well, the, we're, when, we're, we're mentioning the British Museum. Uh, when are you, if you haven't already? Um, Thank you, David. Visit, uh, yeah. yeah, we are. Uh, in actual fact, I uh, I've been exchanging emails with Jennifer Wexler uh, today. Uh, she's uh, one of the main curators for uh, for the exhibition, and we are going to be there. He said, looking at his diary. Uh, in the in the last week of June, we'll be there. Um, probably twenty fourth or twenty fifth, something yeah. like that. After um, we've done our filming. Uh, after we've done our filming, and yeah. uh, it's wonderful because it's just, it's just just me and Michael 
and the curator's museum to ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> we shall report back. Yeah, we will. If, um, if not live broadcast, who knows? Anything is possible. Listen, let's move on to the next question. We can. Oh, I just want to say, though, here, Hel Helena, hello, Helena, as she's put, Cheshire's all right, but as a Lancashire lass, I consider it part of the South. <laughs> 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 of course you do. Yes, yeah. uh, nice one. <laughs> all right. Ryan Rogers, has there been anything new to come out recently to help settle the debate over the Sruti Mastodon site? This was big news in my home state and the world for maybe six months. Then Bupkis. I've never heard use that. I've never used that phrase. <laughs> that, it, uh, uh, I'm yeah. worried. Will this turn out to be one of those times where archaeologists just scowl at each other for another 50 years until the chief proponent of one side dies and the other declares victory? <laughs> <laughs> I knew nothing about the uh, Saruti Master on the site, Ryan. So thank you for this because it's a it's a great... yes. You did. We did an article about it a year or so ago, oh. two years ago. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> what are you like? <laughs> we <re> <laughs> yeah, we did. We did an article about it ages ago. Um, <laughs> just <laughs> it was um, brief. Yeah, maybe. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'm uh, still thanking Ryan for reminding me of the reading <laughs> <the laughs> mastered on site. <laughs> Because uh, yeah. I mean, we 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 did a prehistory flash. It was a very quick, you know, uh, ten minute or something uh, uh, about mm. it. And I don't think we'd really touched on the depth of the controversy uh, around it. And that's the the question here. And, and I had to do a little bit of a digging round to see what's been going on in the last uh, few, well, quite a few mm. years actually since the original. Uh, discovery and uh, you know when the paper itself was was published um mm. uh, can you wrap it up for people because i mean yeah the, 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 so for, for those about? of you that don't know um the um the the uh the uh Chiruti or saruti master is is, uh, is in california and uh, some bones were excavated that uh, that looked to have been split by humans, but they were dated to how old were they dated? Two hundred thirty thousand years ago, which obviously is way earlier than uh, than we're supposed to have had humans in uh, in the Americas. Uh, whether or not they were humans, that's another argument altogether. Uh, the, yeah, the, the thing is that to put a, a number on it, that's 115,000 years too early for yes, most. Yes, <laughs> it's, it's, quite, it's, it's quite early. Um, but uh, the, the thing is that there, uh, so there was the, this uh, discovery that was made uh, some years ago, not that long ago. Um, I can't remember when it was actually dug up in the first place. Um, it, it was in the 1990s. Uh, yeah. I don't remember exactly when. Um, and so all this evidence was sh uh, was implying that uh, humans had been there um, splitting animal bones. Now, there was then another branch of research that completely dismissed that and said that what had actually been happening was it was during road building that the trucks had been... Uh, driving backwards and forwards over this piece of land where they were found, where the bones were found, and that actually it was the weight of the trucks driving backwards and forwards over the underlying stones that split the bones and that this was actually nothing to do with human activity at all. Mm. Fast forward to 2021. 2021 is the most recent um published work about the site and in 2021 they showed categorically that the dismissal was nonsense and these really are worked bones and they know that they're worked bones because the uh, the splits of the bones have pattern on them from uh, you know they can date the split to 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 then the splitting of the bones was nothing to do with the trucks driving backwards and forwards over them. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, uh, so the straight answer to that question is no. It's not one of those situations where people will be slagging them each other off for ages, uh, waiting to see who, who's, uh, whose theory uh, lands. It ha it has been proven. Uh, I wouldn't go quite what... that far myself. I don't think it has been been proven. But there we go. Uh, I I think when we say proven it's not been accepted it certainly you know, in in a few people's eyes it has been proven but it's not been accepted that's um, clear i i will okay. uh, accept that and mm. and i'll raise you a uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah because, because the, the only it, it, thing that they've proven is that it can't have been the uh, modern trucks doing it because the trucks the split the, yeah uh, because of the ancient carbon pattern uh, on the bones, these breaks took place before, um, uh, or not only the, the brake patterns uh, uh, um, tell you, if people that know about these things, that the break happened when the bones were fresh, but also that there's this carbon pattern uh, uh, that has formed over uh, the, the breaks, so it can, can only have happened way 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 mm. way way uh, back the, the other um, bit of the thing was that they uh, analyzed some of the stones that were said to have been the stones over which the the uh, bones would have been broken and they have been analyzed and they found that the slight fleshy remains only persist on one side of these rocks consistent with the, them being having been rushed uh, uh, used as, as crushing stones hmm. um so yeah so i it, the the needle has nudged in favor of the original <laughs> yeah um it's an interesting one isn't it hmm. um are, are you uh, laughing at me it, or something somebody said in the chat i can never tell no 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 <laughs> i'm just laughing at the situation generally because because the other thing is that uh, something that gets uh ignored completely in, in every situation like this, something that gets ignored is that there must have been any number of um, species. I mean, there, there are species of monkey in the Americas, for example, who, um, uh, who use anvils and, uh, and stones to crack open nuts, for example. We, they do that today. Hmm. Um, and so because there's evidence of worked bones doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that this is human activity it doesn't mean that at all um, it might but mm -hmm. we don't know yeah it's a fascinating story because we come full uh, right up against that thing about how you prove things by judging what is the more likely explanation mm. for something I, I ran this analogy mm. by rupert earlier and i think it kind of works it's, it's like if you if you had a, a coin and you tossed it 20 times and it come up heads each time and so you be well, at what point do you conjecture that you've got a one a, a, a double-headed coin and will your naysayers come no you haven't well, you haven't you haven't tossed it enough times and anyway you couldn't toss it enough times to prove because it all, could always be chance that it came up that way what what's the uh, event horizon where people accept that something is the most likely even though it can't be proved that, well, that these things are the cause i mean some people will say well it was the tumbling of the rocks and uh, that crushed the bones in 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 some sort of landslide in pre prehistory um, although that has mm. been debunked and, you know, part of the reasons why they began to think that the human activity was responsible was because these things were arranged in a cluster, you know, not a random thing at all. These weren't random things all over the place. These were clustered together <coughs> in the arrangement mm. you'd expect if human beings had been gathering together and making a mess, you know, and, and sort of putting things in particular places. One aspect mm. of it was was a tusk. One of the tusks had been driven straight down into the ground, you know. And I think it's one of those mm. things where 
if you handle this, handle this stuff, if you look at it, if you've got in your in your your hands and you're you've had the trowel out and and dug these thumbs, you you, you get a feeling for it, and so then. It must be mortifying when other people that haven't handled the actual stuff comes come along and say that can't be so. Mm. And that's the thing. Mm. There aren't many people that have come in to do work on this stuff. They've everybody's sniped from afar. <laughs> yes. Getting their, no. their so own hands dirty. Yeah. So often the case. Uh, Dorman uh, said, could it have been the weight of a glacier? Um, uh, no, just because the pressure's uh, wrong. Yeah. The way it's split is, you, you've is got, wrong. You've got actual um, a actual points of, of the, 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 some of the impact pressure points. points impa yeah. Impact points, that's it. it. can only have been made by something actually hitting it. Like, they're not pressure breaks. They're, they're breaks that occur. The, the analogy that the original authors uh, made is if you've got a pane of glass and you, you've got a ball bearing pellet from a gun hits it, there's a dish shaped um, thing that comes out the other side. You get a, a sort of little little dish shaped um, uh, piece that, that, that comes out. Absolutely indicative of a very hard, hard hit to a single point. The, the damage occurs on the other side of the surface which you're hitting mostly and that is uh, um, uh, uh, you know uh, the uh, the giveaway uh, of what's happening there so uh, the answer is the needle has moved towards the original hypothesis that it, humans were responsible but there's still a hell of a lot of people that don't like it and never will like it because you know careers and reputations depend on this a lot of egos mm. depend on this. <laughs> That's true. Uh, Yacek is just commenting here. Uh, 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 my friend Yacek, who says, uh, it, it seems not that difficult to compare the surfaces of the outer part of the bone and splinter sides. Uh, Yacek's a surgeon. He knows his bones. <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it, it's true. It's just it's funny how... Um, People do like to dismiss things. And, and you know what? I will shamelessly uh, bring up um, our friend Bruce Bradley. Uh, uh, those yeah. of you um, over uh, in the States uh, may well know uh, Bruce Bruce's work uh, uh, better than uh, folks um, in, in Europe, certainly. But uh, Bruce did a huge amount of research um, uh, about... Uh, stone artifacts complete assemblages that were excavated in um, uh, in the states and he showed that uh, and in fact it's you know it's still controversial but uh, the salutrian hypothesis and he was showing that the salutrians who were basically a, a, a culture from uh, france and spain and their technology is present in america and he got so much flack for uh, for this research. Uh, a lot of people still don't accept it to this day. And um, and the, the thing is that the, the point that Bruce makes is that if you had found these assemblages anywhere else in the world at all, anywhere, then everybody would have said, "Oh, look, the Salutrians have been here," because the the the, the stones are very very distinctly made you know they, like all, all the different um cultures had a particular way of, uh, of of making their blades and and it's the fact that uh it was dismissed simply because they were in america and there there is this attitude that people cannot have traveled across the atlantic in prehistory and it's just it's a, it's a stupid attitude because we know from historical accounts that the Polynesians would travel thousands of miles of open ocean in canoes. We know that to be true. So why we can say and you know and Inuits following the ice sheets, you know that um, you, you you've only got to go back, uh, you know, to not long before Clovis. 
and you've still got ice sheets, you know, as the tail end of the ice age, you've still got ice sheets going across from Europe mm. to America. And, uh, you know, you follow those ice sheets and you come out in New England, uh, you know, up there. So to dismiss it as impossible is stupid. Clearly it's possible. Jacek um, uh, updated that. Yeah, I've seen some chimpanzees. What have you said, Jacek? Uh, well, I've seen that some chimpanzees open not only nuts with, with the sharp edge stones. Uh, mm. Yeah. Uh, Helena said, I thought there was recent evidence for human species in the Americas uh, 120,000 years ago. They've been finding a lot more stuff in the last they few have, years. They have, um... but, but 120,000 years ago, I mean, that's in the ballpark. And uh, I, I don't know about that, uh, Helena, if you could... Uh, mm. Um, uh, give us a, and he also said, "What about Denisovans?" And yeah, one hundred and thirty thousand years ago, which is what this thing was uh, talking about. Uh, they are candidates mm -hmm. because they're they're one of the only three known uh, hominids that uh, were existing at the time. Well, you know, obviously, the, the, sapiens, the, the, Neanderthals, or uh, Denisovans. Yeah, uh, Denisovans. Um, no, I can't remember their start date as far as we know. We know that they went. Ex uh, they died out. 30 what is it 37,000 years ago something like that um but uh, yeah i don't know their start date but either way you know i mean you clearly uh, um you know to dismiss things as impossible just because they don't fit your personal preferred reality mm. is uh is silly you you've just you, you have no option but to go with the evidence if you're dismissing the evidence then you're <clears throat> being silly yeah, I, uh. I I wouldn't. I, it's, to be fair, I wouldn't put it quite like that. I I think there's a there's, there's a. It's not just uh, the ego or people saying it can't have been. It, there's a procedural thing as as well. I, I think that there are sticklers for absolute proof, and this and it, 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 this yeah. kind of evidence is not proof. It's a it's a mixture of of both. Some don't like the archae the archaeology. Yes. Some just don't like the paper for the way yes. it was it was done, and some yeah. come from it can't yeah. be so. So I'll find yeah. justify my reasoning for, for yeah. it. Can't you be so. you you have to leave it as open if you don't know the other way. I, I just uh, I pick up something that Francis has said. Hello, Francis. Yeah. Uh, so far, the DNA is showing no indication that there were any Europeans in America uh, who could have brought uh, Salutrian uh, technology. Uh, yeah, maybe, although there is um, uh, the the only, as far as I'm aware, the only Native American tribe who do uh, show uh, European uh, DNA are the Ojibwe tribe. And the interesting thing about the Ojibwe tribe is that uh, although they've pretty much spread out through a lot of, uh, of uh, America, their source point, where they're first known to have been in the States, is uh, is in the north, around New England. Um, and once again, if you if you take the theory of uh, uh, of following the ice sheets from Europe across to the States, then that is where you would end up. So that you know, it's a compelling possibility there mm. uh, so i certainly wouldn't dismiss that as a possibility obviously you know we'll, we'll know eventually but yeah. uh, it's like pulling teeth sometimes isn't it uh, and to be fair the prehistory of the of the americas it is still a bit of a blank page uh, for us so we're, we're always glad of opportunities for you know having I insights into um, what's going on in uh, in the americas um you know what's known so uh, forgive us if our knowledge you know, our contextual knowledge for this is a bit patchy. Okay, can we move mm. on? Let's move yeah. on. Let's do another question now. And it's a question from Steve, Steve Bull, no, num, Steve Bull, number nine. Hello, Other Steve. nine Steve Bulls. Do you know much <laughs> about Lee Down Circle in northern Somerset, in north Somerset? I spent a lovely weekend away in that part of the world and visited some excellent sites such as Felton Common and the lovely named uh, Fairy Toot 
Is there more to your question? I think there is. However, when I was walking near Regil, I saw some stones that I assumed were modern in someone's garden, but have since discovered it, claimed that they are a lost stone circle. I haven't been able to find much more about it, um, however, other than what is in the link. Uh, and that was um, uh, uh, another link. Let me show you. Um, because we're actually on the megalithic portal here. Uh, and mm. the, the, what um, Steve is talking about here is this page, which is the only thing you can find about Lee Down Stone Circle. Um, I will get the link now and put it in the chat so that you can get a better view and uh, look at it at your own leisure. Uh, mm. There it goes. Uh, yeah, I, I won't I, lie to you, uh, Steve. I, I I had not heard of it uh, bef before you sure. asked the question. We had to go and look it up. Um, uh, but it's interesting. There is, uh, in, in fact, you can probably see towards the bottom. There you go. Mike's just scrolling the page up. The, now you the can text see there's, here. Uh, there's a text uh, there, and that is an account from eighteen. Let me just go. Let me just go large with that. See if I can. Go large. I've gone large. <laughs> there we are. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> yes, yeah, uh, an, an account uh, from uh, late 1900s uh, in which somebody was surmising or had heard that uh, it was thought that. Um, the this stone circle was the site from which some of the stones had been transported to the enormous stone circle and still extant stone circle um and second is it second largest rupert uh stanton drew yeah yes second largest stone circle in uh, yeah. in britain in britain um yeah uh, so it's that kind of stone it's a sort of muddy brown uh, sort of stuff. It's not usual sort of grey. Uh, this is it's quite a, a muddy sort of reddy brown uh, colour. So no stones are in, present in an upright position. It is is possible with one or two lying prone may be present in the mass of brambles and bracken now. February nineteen fifty eight cover the site. Yeah, I'm rambling there, so I didn't fully read that. Um, uh, it's a bit of a we, we've got nothing to bring to the party here, really, have we? No, we don't. <laughs> Rupert. We don't. Uh, I mean, we, we, with uh, with the, the greatest respect, Steve, the, we're not going to add anything uh, to to dwell on it. We hadn't heard of it before, and mm. Andy's entry on megalithic is is the only one we found. Yeah. So that doesn't mean that it's uh, that it's uh, that, you know that it's not an old circle, but. Um, uh, but we don't know. Uh, uh, digging more digging needs to be done. The the other little thing snippet that I read. There is a picture on the uh, on the site. Let me get back to it. Just a second, just so you know what it is that I'm talking about. Uh, if we scroll to where is that picture? Oh yeah, it's a bit dark, but. No, it's not going to do it for me. Oh, yes, there it is. Um, here's a picture there you can see with a very tidy uh, stone row, double stone row, or a stone mm. avenue leading up to the circle, uh, mm. which looks distinctly modern, and that's because it is. Mm. However, yeah. however, it is said that the places where these stones were placed were uh, doused. <clears throat> they doubt that it is said that they doused this uh, stone row uh, and uh, they found uh, sockets for these uh, stones to go uh, go mm. there so uh, i i have to say i would have been happier if the if, if i would have been happier if the dowsers had then got geophys in to uh, to confirm their finding there you go um mm -mm. Uh, like um, I say, we're not going to absolutely bring zilch, nothing, zero to the party here. Um, yes, but we like 
finding about out about new stuff. And where is it? Somerset? Uh, what, yeah, lay maybe down? Find, yeah, maybe find an excuse when I'm going out to uh, getting footage for uh, Barrows. Maybe pay a visit. You've gone a bit blurry, Rupert. Never mind. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I can only apologise. Right. <laughs> Anything? Sh uh, yeah. Shall we leave that? I can't add to that. We... Move on. Move on. Uh, yeah. But thanks for the question, Steve. <laughs> Jorman, we know you're there. Um, Hello, Jorman. And you're, yeah, you're forgiven there. for being late. I know you were late, but better, it was better late than never, but you've been here for most oh, of the time. Oh, I like this question. Oh, yes. Do you know of any evidence or have opinions on possible connections between the dolmens in Europe and those in India? You like this question. I, I do, I do find like this it a question. Bit, sort of big well, red herring myself. I know you do. Um, the, the thing is, I, I'd looked into this a lot. Uh, uh, in fact, it, this is, I'm talking about 15 years ago, more. Uh, it, it, it was around the time that we had uh, we had finished Standing With Stones and and I was looking at what were we going to do next. And, and and I was looking at You're global looking. megalithic culture. I'm still looking, yeah. I was looking at global megalithic culture. And the interesting thing about the dating of dolmens, because dolmens are pretty much global, um, uh, and that's an interesting point that I'll come back to in a sec. Um, the highest density anywhere in the world of dolmens is on the Korean peninsula. And there are 35,000 dolmens just on the Korean peninsula, um, which is pretty much the same amount as there are in the whole of Europe, right? That's a lot. But the thing is, as you go east, they get younger. So we've got dolmens in Europe and Britain that are five, 6,000 years old. And you start going east and they get uh, to, you know, even you know, 3,000 years old. It's a, it's a huge spread of time. Um, but that doesn't negate the, uh, you know, the possibility that there are connections because there's something that's, that's a complete aside from dolmens. But so, for example, something that was only discovered uh, a couple of years ago is uh, there are paintings in Greece uh, in a site on Fera, um, there's a painting of monkeys, lots of different species of monkey. And one of those monkeys is very, very clearly a Hanuman Langa, which comes from the Indian subcontinent. They don't come from anywhere else. And it's very recognizable for a couple of features anyway. So it's definitely what it is. So you're, you're talking about uh, an exchange, whether it's a trade route, we don't know, but but there was certainly connection between peoples over what's that two and a half thousand miles. Mm -hmm. uh, so the fact that you have dolmens which are Bronze Age in uh, uh, in India, the Iron Age. That uh, Okay. Yeah, but uh, but it, again, the the dating. I take. Uh, I can't say I take issue with the dating. I don't take the dating as definitive, um, because uh, the, it, you know we've made this analogy many times over the years. That imagine we're excavating Westminster Abbey, where Edward the Confessor was buried in 1066. Well, Laurence Olivier was buried in there in, uh, I can't remember when he died. Um, uh, but, it, you know, what are you excavating? If the remains that you find give you a date, fine. But that doesn't tell you when the site itself was built. Um, so I, I don't dismiss the possibility. I think there's more work to be done. Okay. The, the thing is, you know, like so, when you make a a framework to investigate mm. you've got to ask the question well how am i going to how am i going to answer that question you know mm. before it becomes worth a worthwhile question mm. you, you, or, or hypothesis it's very well all very well putting forward the hypothesis but of a connection but what do i look for 
that that nails it? What what brings it all together um, and, and makes it a worthwhile uh, I- investigation? Well, you've got to get the money for the funding in the first place, haven't you? So, <laughs> well, you'll um, never I mean, you'll never get the money for the, the funding. funding for the excavation. Is what I meant. The money for go on. Well, but you'll never get the money for the unless you unless you're asking the right question. Exactly. Uh, the funding doesn't um, come unless you, um, you. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You've uh, got to you've got to find that question uh, before. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, and you you can't really get round the fact that if a dating on anything, I mean, you know, let's be honest. We give uh, we give broad dates to you know pick any number of prehistoric sites in Britain. Uh, when the vast majority of them haven't been excavated, they're best guesses. Um, and it is true that sometimes as we move forwards, uh, the, the, the datings get confirmed, but yeah. equally you get dates like, you know, there were excavations done at Avebury not very long ago that completely threw the dating out of the water um, at one of the enclosures. Um, so we can't, take anything for granted with our best guesses we might be right but we might not yeah but it's a hell of a breach you know the 2000 year gap because when we're talking about dolmens the general area for dolmens over this side uh, of the continent is uh, is you know around about 4000 to 3500 bc so that's 2000 yeah. years before the earliest date for dolmens mm. in in india um, yeah. So that's a heck of a that's a heck of a reach to overcome. I don't know how you begin. Con- you know, uh, conclusively. Uh, conclusively, or I mean, you have no well, option. Realistically, yeah. uh, uh, excavating is the only way. Mm. Um, um, but we're sort of uh, yeah. I, I don't know. That said, you know, or my complaints said, there is an article, there is a paper, and I'm going to give you a link to it, folks. I'm going to put all these links in the uh, in the description below later on after this is finished, because I think the chat may just heads up. The chat will probably be um, disappearing from this when it's... Uh, published and you'll be able to watch the recording because I will shave off the 10 minute um, pre-show bit and if I edit (laughs) after the event the chat goes so just uh, heads up about that but here's a link to an actual paper um, and I'll show you what I'm talking about screen share there we go um, it's called Mystery of the Similarities of Indian, European and British Megaliths, a Consideration of Possible Influences in a- Antiquity. So mm. somebody's asked the question and has done good work. You know, there's, there you go. There's a lot of words mm. and pictures to have a mm. look at. Mm. So, yeah, somebody's I, done I, I have really to say... They have. I have to say, with uh, with the greatest respect to this work, I think there, there's a lot of it where um, you're making connections with things that just because they look similar. Um, so, like you know, hold stones, for example. Well, you know, there's all sorts of reasons you might have a hold stone. Um, yeah. But, well, well, there's uh, a good reason why dolmens look uh, look similar because once you get the bright idea in your head of of raising a, a stone above the ground, getting a big stone and raising it above the ground, the most economic way of doing it is to get not two, not four, but three. <laughs> two doesn't work. Uh, three's perfect, and four's overkill, giving yourself too much work. No wonder dolmens look like they do once you've uh, embraced the idea of raising a piece of rock uh, uh, above mm. the ground to provide shelter for anything or, or mark any any spot at all so yeah i think we should move along though because time move on. is I'm getting, just going to say really... thank you lily yes uh, I, d- I know i know uh, yeah yeah time disappears um okay bonnie Hello, Bonnie. Uh, you, you see, I'm pausing because I was working out how to pronounce your surname properly, and I presume that's your surname. Ever, ever, 
Ever, oh, I'm sorry. I Ever apologize. Ever That's a cool yeah. name. Yeah, that really, really is. I'd like to know the the uh, the provenance of that, the, where, where that name has come from. Anyway, sorry, Bonnie. Um, there is a theory on the internet that enclosure AB in Karantepe could be an early form of hypercost, like the Romans built. Could that be true? Enclosure AB is the one with the pillars and the stone face coming out of the wall. Oh, goodness gracious me. Right, shall we go to Karan Tepe, see if I've got... Go to Karan Tepe. Um, um, oh, yeah, I like okay. the idea personally. I, I look at it and I just say, well, that's certainly what it looks like. Yeah, this is a uh, um, part of the excavation at Karan Tepe. And we're talking uh, 11,500 years ago, this settlement. And this is a sort of very, uh, very sister, old. sister excavation yeah. to Gobekli Tepe, uh, not far away at all. Well, I didn't realize how extensively uh, Karan Tepe has already been excavated. Yeah. But a bit of context here. I don't know if the next picture uh, gives a bit wider context for it yes that, that's a sort of more aerial view of the structure in in question just off to the left there you can see the 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 outlines of a bigger room kind of next door so it's not just this bit that's been excavated it's quite an extensive excavation and uh it's huge yeah this, this is sort of like a occurs like a kind of anteroom or an addition to this large room off to the left. I'm sorry, I haven't got a, a, a bigger picture there. Um, but there you have it. And the reason for this uh, hypothesis is, well... Yeah. That, I can't remember which Roman site that is, but that's in Britain. And, and that is a, a hypercourse. And a, a further illustration of how that blooming well works. There's mm. your uh, wealthy hoi polloi up above <laughs> in the warmth being heated mm. from below uh, a supported floor because the uh, air or what have you in that bottom area is being heated by the servants um, by whatever means. And you, bingo, you've got central heating. Mm. All right. Does that all make sense now? And then we'll go back to this. And yeah. is that a hypercourse? I mean, the other thing is, look at the channels cut here. Mm. What's that about? Over to the mm. right there. Is that a water channel? Uh, Has to they, be. They, cer they, they certainly know at Gebekli Tepe that um, uh, there's a lot of water management was going on there. That's right, yeah. Uh, so yeah. no and reason look, to think that it wasn't happening here as well. Look over to the left there, where the, the, the where it adjoins the larger room. What's that about? The the look, looks like a little opening for some kind of a, a trap door. There are mm. so many details that to this that do need explanation. Uh, and yeah. I, I, I I'm game with that idea. Um. I've forgotten the name of the guy. If you do a search for uh, Karan Tepe and um, uh, Hypercourse, hyper you'll find a guy on YouTube, uh, and I've forgotten his name, uh, that is, uh, he's probably not the only one expanding the idea, but he's the known one uh, that has put forward uh, this idea. Uh, and he's got a full video or a number of videos uh, about this. And so, well... Yeah. Why don't you have a look and make up your own mind? Uh, you know, looking at that, I'm flabbergasted and I, I, I um, mm. can't think of another, you know, it fits for me. It works for me, me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I've got no objection to it mm. is what I'm saying. I don't think Gra I'm Graham doing. is suggesting that that's uh, an overflow uh, channel it could be absolutely it could be <laughs> well, when i was looking around I, I did see another illustration of a hypercost and it was heating baths mm. um you know the 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 area underneath was heating the uh swimming baths up uh, up above you know again roman Sister i don't think i've got even. anything more yeah, to add to maybe, that maybe, but i, I would maybe. love to uh roam 
about the, those great aerial shots in the video I'm talking about. The, actually, these shots are taken from the, those aerial shots, the drone shots, I should say, uh, of yeah. the site. And if you go to Sketchfab, uh, there's a 3D, uh, there's a 3D uh, model uh, of Karan Tepe, which uh, you can browse at your leisure. What are you giggling about? Mm. No, because uh, Lily has mentioned again. I think we love you, Lily. <laughs> Lily <laughs> says, there's at least 20 odd folks watching who've not clicked like. <laughs> uh, thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Bo Bonnie said she saw the video as well, but she's not sure. Well, uh, well <clears throat> I'm not sure either, but I, I, I can't quarrel with the. Uh, with the thoughts. No, it's, yeah. it's especially it's when you good, take into perfectly good theory um, account the, those mm. water channels running into that area and uh, the 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 what looks like mm. a little sluice at, at the end there. Fascinating mm. stuff. Okay, uh, let's move on um, yeah. to uh, Benjamin Benjamin Lawrence. Hi, Benjamin. Hello, Benjamin. <clears throat> I think you're here. Uh, Benjamin says he was musing on the phrase, the winner. I think this is the last question, in case you're wondering, folks. I was musing on the phrase, the winners write the history books. Do we see this motif played out in prehistory? Is mm -hmm. there evidence of a population or any kind of marked change at times of monument building? A bit like Norman cathedrals imposing themselves on the Anglo-Saxon landscape. Or were the trickles of people too tentative to be tyrannical? Are the swathes of time too big to be precise about? I like your rhetoric there. I like your your, your prose there, Benjamin. Um, it's a it's a really great question, uh, actually, and I can't think of something as you know uh, iconoclastic that uh, you're referring to in prehistory. The thing about the phrase "the winners write." the history books. Often that's got the added spin of propaganda associated with it, i.e. the Tudors, you know, were out for the, the Plantagenets, and in particular Richard III. So this is why we get the bad news, only get the bad news about Richard III, because he lost to Henry VII uh, um, up the road here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> dug, dug myself a hole there, didn't, didn't I? Yeah, mm. I'll think of it later on, and I'll, I'll, I'll burst. I'm a fit of Tourette's about a uh, battle site. Benjamin has uh, has thanked you for the prose praise. Uh, I can only echo it, uh, Benjamin. Beautifully written question. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, I got, in in history, uh, yes, the the winners write the history books. Uh, it's, are there signs though? I, mean, I can only look for signs in prehistory of um, uh, iconoclastic takeover. The only obvious well, sort of go on, Rupert. Sorry. No, I was going to say I mean, we we know that we've had more than one mass. Um, you know, migration. We there's no evidence to suggest that it was um, a, 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 was an aggressive takeover. But you know, beaker culture coming into Britain, you know, is a complete cultural overturn. Um, and uh, there are various points in prehistory where you can see a huge cultural change taking place. The trouble is that because you know, by definition, it's prehistory. There's nothing written down to tell us one way or another whether it was the winners uh, making the cultural change or if it was a perfectly peaceful transition where, no, that's a good idea. Let's all do that then. Uh, you know, there, there's not really any, any way of knowing. Uh, I think when you see evidence of whole-scale battle situations like Tollens Valley uh, in Germany, I mean, it would be lovely to be able, uh, if, you, if you could piece those pieces together and find out what was that battle about and what was the result of that battle. I mean, we just, we, there's no way of knowing. Mm -mm. But um, it would be lovely if we could. Jimmy, you've done nothing wrong. Uh, we'll get to, to what you're asking <laughs> yeah, we're coming to you, Jimmy. later. Don't worry, don't worry. 
um, so uh, the, the, the only thing that really strongly p springs to my mind is the Neolithic Bronze Age transition, where we've got the influx of the uh, Beaker folk uh, into the Wiltshire area in, in particular. And uh, we get r after 2500 BC, we get round mounds appearing. Round, mount, round barrows uh, are one, it sounds like, it doesn't sound like that much of a change because before that, barrows were long barrows. But barrow, long barrows had petered out of use uh, a good thousand years before then anyway. You know, so the, so the round barrows weren't replacing long barrows. Round barrows were arriving fresh, new, and they represent a completely different worldview to that which had gone before. You know, coming up to the end of the Neolithic, they didn't seem to be doing bothering much about burying their dead anywhere. That's a, there's a dearth of uh, of burial, you know, of um, human remains for people to be able to uh, discern what was going on towards the back end of the Neolithic. But when the beakers arrived, bang, you've got the, the uh, single burials with grave goods. You, you've got the uh, Amesbury Archer, amongst others. You've got. Um, <clears throat> Bush, Barrow, Lozenge, oh gosh. Uh, so a massive cultural change uh, occurring, um, it, which doesn't seem like much on the face of it, but under the surface it's massive because you've got a completely different worldview. Long Barrow is about um, uh, communal burial and uh, a very different relationship to uh, the dead and family and elites and so on and so forth. Um, round barrows tend to contain single uh, burials with grave goods. No grave goods before the beakers arrive. So that's the big one that I can I can think of. Um, mm -hmm. Can you think of uh, you know ob any obvious others apart from obviously the obvious one is the arrival of farming. <laughs> Boom. Um, um, yeah. Well, uh, Kevin says uh, aggressive. Uh, the population survival of Neolithic peoples in Spain, 100% Y chromosome replacement, but only 50% mDNA replacement. Very good. Very um, good. It, it's yeah. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> it's a compelling point, isn't it? Mm. Um, uh, but uh, again, I mean, uh, yes. All right, you could say it's aggressive, but but the thing is, that I I can think of, and and you know, we don't have the time to toss this around right now, but. But you know, I can think of a few scenarios where it needn't have been uh, an aggressive uh, takeover. Um, oh yes, and that—that's the difference. There's no evidence at all that these kind of takeovers were aggressive uh, mm -hmm. uh, in any way. Uh, some people like to believe they were. Some people, but uh, the most likely is a, is a gradual. Um, um, mm. osmosis <laughs> as, uh, as, yeah. as people gradually uh, migrate uh, immigration uh, yeah. uh, occurs over over time no need for I mean Ke uh, Kevin's absolutely right he's pointing out about the Basque DNA and it's true that you know the, the Basque you know yeah. <laughs> today I mean the the, the Basque is is uh, as, as far as I'm aware it's the it's it's the oldest extent uh, uh, genetic uh, identity there is, isn't there, for Europe? Um, well, that'll but, be my uh, phone. That, uh, that'll be your phone, yes. Do you know what, can you get that? Tell them I'm busy. <laughs> oh dear, well done. What am I like? Um, I know who that was as yeah. well. <laughs> Settle down, settle uh, down. Yeah, um, yeah. No, thanks, Kevin. I mean, you know, good, good points, good points. You know. <laughs> mm. um, um, I, but my, my brain, I, I can't uh, really go any further than that. You know, other, there's, a, there's a big difference between, uh, you know, the, the obvious propaganda of things being uh, the pol political necess necessity of demolishing what went before uh, in order to mm. aggrandize yourself. But... We can never know that kind of stuff, and, and even then, you know how such uh, information would have been disseminated at the time. 
Mm. Uh, shall we uh, now begin to call it a day, uh, Rupert? Uh, and, uh, yes, and, and address Jimmy. <laughs> and, and say hello to, to Jimmy. Uh, we didn't want to uh, appear to be uh, being rude there. Just a bit of context there. Uh, Jimmy asked us a question. Jimmy Lawley uh, asked us a, a question uh, a couple of weeks ago now, wasn't it? Uh, it's, about, a, it's a while uh, back, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jimmy, Jimmy's uh, one of our stalwarts. And, uh, and yeah. uh, yeah, so it's... Uh, uh, the last time he asked the question, we hadn't actually, uh, uh, we hadn't really understood. Uh, it, Jimmy told us afterwards we hadn't actually understood what he was asking us really, so yeah, we yeah. we didn't answer his question. So, um, so the the misunderstanding here is that, that that Jimmy sort of just reminded us that we hadn't, or, or sort of clarified the question. He didn't actually ask a question mm -hmm. at the beginning. Uh, anyway, that's beside the point. The question that Jimmy was asking about uh, evidence for or thoughts on uh, um, the relief on certain megalithic sites, i.e. the uh, spirals, zigzags, all those kinds of things, whether they would have been painted or not. Um, mm. I, I guess as long as you got the materials, there's no reason to say not. But unfortunately, I, to my mm. mind, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that they were painted no it's colored. an interesting one isn't it because there's there's no uh, the, the, you know the, there's no pigmentation remaining uh, if it was there then you know obviously i suppose because of the nature of the sort of stones that we're talking about and certainly british climate that it's all just eroded away but when you look at sites in whether it's mexico or egypt yeah or you know there's all sorts of sites where we know that they were decorated so there's there's no reason to presume that they weren't uh, and the other thing that you know michael and i make the point all the time that uh, that we see these naked stone circles but we genuinely have no idea if that was you know if that simplicity is how they appeared back in the day might be but they might have had any number of timber horizontals or um oh uh, thank you, know, you they... yes uh, there is evidence there is uh, the only evidence i think there is is that uh, on the inside uh of um the nessa brogga of some of the buildings in the nessa brogga they have found paint in some of the motifs scratched on on the walls um Inside the Nessa Brodga. Yep. Um, so I, I, I suppose that, uh, you know, you, you, know you, you can extend that, can't you, to uh, uh, stone circles because we still, you know, we don't know what they were, mm. do we? Um, yeah, why not? Interesting. I didn't know they'd found pigment at the Ness, actually. I did, did but I I'd forgotten. That? And why would I forget a, something like that? But there it I is. I don't know. It is there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, Jim is just commenting back. He said, "I compared them to medieval cathedrals." Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it, 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 yeah. it is, uh, but we do have uh, concrete evidence um, at the Ness, and uh, I confess I had forgotten about that. I mean, it's not much, but it's enough. If they were doing it once. <laughs> if, they were, if if once is enough, if they were doing it once, they were doing it more than once. You know. It, it, uh, and it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, what, are you, what are you laughing at me or laughing at the? No, I'm laughing like at a... Graham. Graham has said they must have been decorated, dressed so well that you could project your monarch on them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry that that, that, oh, that wasn't the finest jubilee moment, no, was it? Really? Let's not go there. Yeah. Oh, please! Uh, That's Kevin says it's found all over the Orkneys. What pigment, really? Is it? Okay. Right. Good. See, Here we go. I know, Kevin. I know thank you, Kevin. We see look, Kevin, he, he should be a prehistory guy. He should be running this show. <laughs> From, <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know that, Kevin. Um so yeah. thanks. All right. I've got That's some homework great. to do then. That's great. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Jimmy will say uh, will be thanking you, Kevin. So uh Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well it would be an interesting exercise, wouldn't it? You know, to to pretend to to put the color in there, see how they look, see how it comes out. You know, it, yeah, it, it, it kind of makes sense. But I'd, I'd love, for... yeah. 
Helen says uh, could also have used oils or tars to glue stuff on like feathers and bees, etc. Yeah, absolutely. Why, why not? Why not? Why not? Yeah, mm. I'm. Th I think of uh, our friend uh, Lee from Dartmoor, Doctor Lee yeah. um, um, Bray. Bray, thank you. Um, uh, who was a chief archaeologist on Dartmoor. And, of course, uh, part of that, he knows a bit about uh, the coloured, you know, the representations you get on plaques <laughs> leading to uh, uh, English Heritage or National Trust uh, places and remarking how dour and dark uh, and, and done the people seem to dress Whereas we've got no reason to throw away the idea that they were well into colour uh, in their adornments, in their dress, whatever. You know, if they were able to do it, they would have been doing it. Uh, and, you know, we know there was a lot of ochre at least. But colour is expensive, you know. Mm. Uh, it always has been. Well, up until technology made colour available. Well, it's yeah. certainly time intensive, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the colour blue, jeez. Or oh, the colour purple, gee. Colour purple, mm. the, the 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 suffering of man to create to, to create, create the colour purple. purple. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah thank you, La. Thank, thank you, La. I have to say, in my defence, I'm not using potato cam. I'm using potato bandwidth i can't do anything about that yes yeah. it, it doesn't it doesn't excuse you falling off the side of your screen though sit up straight man for goodness sakes <laughs> do you know what I'll do to... <laughs> <laughs> there you go. yeah anyway on that note i think it's time for us to begin uh wrapping up uh we have no mm. more questions and 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 Gosh, thank you for those questions. It's a yes. fantastic uh, uh, learning curve involved with uh, being able to even speak a word about any of that. So thanks for improving mm. our brains, uh, as you do. Uh, as I said before, uh, if you've not had a look, take a look at our Patreon site. Um, if you've enjoyed yes. this, enjoyed being with, right with us, and, and you're not already a member, uh, have a look over there. Um, join mm. in with a lot of the folk you'll find here. They're a great uh, community, very knowledgeable as well. Sometimes I begin to think they're they're getting better than us. <laughs> hey ho. Um, <laughs> We'll have to start bringing in people in. You know, there's a space. There is a space here for people. There's a space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we can do that. In, yeah, in we'll the get some there. of you troublemakers in here. Yeah. Um, to next time. Next time, maybe. Mm. And, of course, look forward to seeing you next Thursday. No, is it next Thursday? When When's the first actual prehistory show, right? Is next Thursday getting a bit close to us being over at um, you being over here yeah no no no, no. the prehistory show yes is the 7th of july right not till then okay so that's mm -hmm. next month folks mm -hmm. uh, we will really look forward to that that should be uh, and the next q and a i can tell you now although we haven't put the um because up. we don't put the uh, dates up until after the next one after the last one, you know what I mean. Uh, the next Q and A is going to be on the fourteenth of July, uh, uh, and for our, um, our our crew watching, uh, the next Patreon live is on the fifth, Tuesday. Tuesday the fifth okay. of July. Terrific. So uh, we'll begin to get busy again uh, in July, yeah. as uh, we said. Not only are we uh, filming. Uh, soon, but we shall be going down to Bournemouth to attend the uh, Europa Conference, where yeah. the great and the good from the world of prehistoric archaeology will be gathering for two and a half days of uh, lectures and talks and discussion uh, about all things, um, all things prehistoric. Um, so we look forward oh, to Karen, being you can catch there. up, Karen. Sorry. Yeah. That's no, why I was talking to Karen. Um, uh, uh, yes, we were there to heckle on your behalf. <laughs> yes, yeah. I mean, if if you need <coughs> uh, any questions for particular people that uh, you think 
might be there, your favorite archaeologist. They're bound to be there. So if, you, if you've got a sneaky one, um, find a yeah. way of getting it to we'll, it. We'll do our best. Or something we'll do our like best. That. Yeah. So we'll be doing our best to report back from uh, Bournemouth, uh, maybe live, maybe not. Um, but we have the tech, so uh, you know, hold our feet to the fire about getting stuff to you, wherever in the world we may be. With that, I'm going to say ta ta for now from me, from Warwickshire, uh, England. Uh, and ta ta from me in the uh, dark but was sunny south of France. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Thanks ever so much, folks. Yeah, you've been <laughs> absolute stars. Care. Yeah, and if I find the button, I'll be able to end the broadcast. I must find an <laughs> outro, you know, to make it make it nice. Oh, there it is, button down there. Finish, it says. See you, folks. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>